Hey, it's Alicia Kay, and it is time for one of the only things I'm actually consistent with, my October wrap-up. October was an absolutely wild month for reading. I think I read 12 books, I flew way too close to the sun, and honestly, part of the discussion, part of what I've been thinking about is the question, is 12 too many books for me personally to read in a month? Because... I did kind of feel like almost like I had to read all these books since I made a TBR and like pressure to read when I would have rather been doing other things. So I do think some of my other hobbies suffered because I felt the pressure to read. So that is going to be something I keep in mind going forward. But for now, I'm just going to talk about all of the books I read in October. The first book I read in October was Murder and Maman by Mia P. Manansala. This is a book that in my October TBR at the very end, I was like, I also am on the wait list for these books, but I don't think they will come in in October. I thought because of the waiting list at the time that I was going to be reading this book in November. Jokes on me. This ended up being the first book I finished in October. That's my clock. Why do you do this to me, clock? I love having a clock that audibly tells me when it's the hour because it helps me when I'm not actively looking at a clock. But there are a couple times it's not my favorite, like filming videos or when I try to record my music from home. That is beside the point. As I was saying, Murder and Maman came in like September 30th or something. And I started listening to it and finished it. First book of the month. This is the fourth book in the Tito Rosie's Kitchen Mystery series. That is a cozy mystery series that follows a restaurant and like the family kind of that owns this restaurant. And the main character is the niece of the person who owns the restaurant. I'm not going to talk about the synopsis of the fourth book since it is the fourth book in the series, but in the first book we follow as, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting her name, but she moves back from Chicago to this like smaller town after a bad breakup and she ends up helping in this restaurant. One day her ex-boyfriend comes to eat and then he dies and it's kind of everything that happens after that, the mystery of who did it, and obviously the restaurant is under, under suspicion and all of that. I really enjoy this series. And a few months back, I read way too cozy mysteries and was like, I need to take a break. They have made a little bit of a resurgence in my life, especially this month. But also that break was like everything except Mia P. Man and Sala's books because they don't have the same vibes and feelings that some other cozy mysteries can fall into for me. And that's one of the things I talked about was they all kind of feel very similar, but this doesn't feel like that to me. So I'm totally fine with this series and never felt like I needed to take a break from it. And I really enjoyed this fourth book. It was no exception to how much I loved the series if anything, it just made me enjoy the series even more. The next book I read was Payback's a Witch by Lana Harper. This was the book that started it all, that inspired the TBR, and I read it and I enjoyed it. This book follows a woman who has moved away from her small town and in moving away has severed herself from the magic of the town. She doesn't ever want to move back to the small town, but agrees to come back for like a month's period to be the arbiter of a competition that happens every 50 years in this town and involves the four founding families of the town. This book is very fun and I love the vibes of it. It's very witchy. It's very fall. The one thing I maybe didn't love about this book is nothing surprised me. Like overall, I enjoyed this book. I thought the characters were well developed. I liked the relationship dynamics that existed with all sorts of relationships, like romantic, friend, 
family, all of those relationships, I think, had interesting dynamics and were explored in interesting ways. But this book, I thought to be pretty predictable. That didn't draw me out of the story as much as it would have if the characters weren't well developed. But since I was really into the characters and enjoyed them and their relationships, I was happy with, with the book and how everything turned out. And even though nothing really surprised me, I still thought it was a fun read. It was perfect for October. The next book I read was La Hacienda by Isabel Cañas. This is a book about a woman who, after her father dies in a political revolution in Mexico, she escapes to uh, an hacienda and marries a man that she doesn't really know that well. But this place turns out to maybe not be that much of an escape. This book started kind of slow for me. I think it makes sense with like the story arc of a book. But there was actually a period in the beginning of the book where I was thinking about DNFing it because I was a little bit bored. But then as we get into the rising action or maybe like closer to the climax, things were happening and I was into it and I did not want to stop reading. When my parents were here, I was reading this book. They had an extra room in their hotel suite. The people at the hotel upgraded them for free and were like, surprise! <laughs> like they didn't even realize they were being upgraded until they opened the door to their hotel room and it was like, this is not what we booked. I think maybe the front desk person said, but they were like, had no idea. So they convinced us to stay in the second bedroom of their hotel suite to make things a little bit easier for one of our days we had planned. So we'd all be in the same place. And I was reading this book. It was like 1230 or one o'clock in the morning. And I was like, I know I have to wake up at like eight or eight thirty. This is hard deadline because we are going to breakfast and we're going to breakfast at a certain time. My parents wake up super early and I have to wake up. So I had like 50 pages left in this book. It was one o'clock in the morning and I was like, if I stay up and finish this book, I'm only going to get like five and a half or six hours of sleep after I finish it and then finally am able to fall asleep. So I have to put it down. And it was the worst. I really didn't want to put it down. I was so invested in the story. And putting it down was a great, great act of willpower so that I could actually wake up. Because I need a lot of sleep. I'm a sleep queen. I need nine hours a night. And if I get less than nine hours, likely I'll be tired. So if I'm getting six, all bets are off. That day is a non-functional day. That being said, I enjoyed this book. It is probably up there with some of my favorites of the month ended up being up there for me, honestly, because of the end. And well, the middle part to the end. It was really good. The next book I read in October was The Night Circus. This was a reread for me. This is one of my favorite books of all time, if not my favorite book of all time. This follows a circus that only shows up at night and the people who are involved with the circus and it has a competition element and I just love it. I have reread this book a few times. I reread it this time because I'm working on a song about the Night Circus and I think it's done. Not done like recorded, but done like I think all the words are done and I think I know the entire guitar part, which means I can now perform it. If I go places to perform, I can now perform it and that's a really great feeling. And maybe I'll put it on here when I find some time to sit down with my guitar and play it. This reread was no different. I love this book when I started rereading it. Honestly, I started rereading it months ago and I was reading it very slowly as I worked on the song. And just some of the passages, just because of like how much I love this book, just bring me to tears. Also, I just love Erin Morgenstern's writing. I love how she describes everything. It 
it's just beautiful. So yeah, what else do I say about my favorite book of all time? The next book I read in October was Local Woman Missing by Mary Kubica. The first thing I want to say about this book and the first thing that is in my notes, also in my last wrap up, I said I was maybe going to take notes and I did. Who am I? But the first thing in my notes is this book does use the R word. So just like be careful. It is not something that I would say don't read this book because I don't think the author does it. And this is a conversation about like authorial intent and separating art from the artist which I will talk more about later as well. But I think the author does it to illustrate that the bad people are bad. And I don't know that it's necessarily reason not to read the book. I think it comes down to with how comfortable or not you are. There was another book I read a couple of months ago that also used the R word that I was like much more shocked and jarred because it was like, very different context, right? Like, and I do kind of think context matters. I'm not going to get too much into it. That's just like a heads up. So you know, before you start reading this book, this book takes place 11 years after a woman and a young girl went missing. They went missing about a week apart. And 11 years later, the young girl shows up again. And so it's trying to figure out where she been this whole time. And just everything, you know, surrounding these disappearances. This book, I think, has a very interesting concept. There were definitely things I really liked about this book. And it definitely made me, like, invested and engaged for parts of it. The issue was, I think this book could have been way shorter and still had the impact. I read this when I was doing my vlog that is probably going to come out after this, but when it's out, I'll put the link up. Um, I was reading this during this vlog and I talked about in that vlog some of the issues I was having with the book and like whole backstories that didn't feel necessary, that felt out of place, that felt weird, that just like was too much information, like trying to build the characters by giving us backstory to each of these characters when the backstory was unnecessary because we already knew those things about the characters or the characters weren't that important or just like a variety of things that happened around it that I was just kind of bored at certain points. I think this could have been a lot shorter. And sometimes it felt like absolutely nothing was happening. This is tagged as a thriller on Storygraph. I did not find it thrilling at all, which is also why I say it could have been shorter. The action could have been more fast paced. And I think that would have made it actually feel a little bit more thrilling. The next book I read in October was Horror Store by Grady Hendrix. I was also reading this in that vlog and I talked about it a little bit in there as well. This book was much more thrilling. It is much shorter. And I think this is my favorite Grady Hendrix. This is about an Ikea knockoff store that is haunted. And I really enjoyed the story. This is not the first haunted store story I've read. And I don't know if um, the other author was inspired by Grady Hendrix. Like, I don't know of the timeline of when these books came out or if they were both just inspired separately, which is also a thing that can happen. This one is much more well known than the other one. The other one I read is Fina, Fina by Nino Cipri, I think. I know the, the name is Fina. I'll put a picture so you can see. I liked that one a lot as well. They are also like so different with being both kind of like horror stories about stores. One of the things I appreciated about this book was like the witty humor of it and the critique of American working class society and feeling like you are 
uh, subjugated by your job or like your life is your job and your job is your life. That is kind of also talked about a little bit in this book. And I, I thought it was fun. I liked the, um, critique, the humor on it, the satire really is, it's not really a satire book, but that's kind of like an underlying current that I personally really appreciated. One thing I talked about in the vlog was how I got a physical copy of this because I thought there was going to be pictures and there's some pictures, but not a whole lot. So I definitely would have been okay with reading the audiobook. But now that I have the physical copy, I do think I will reread it when it has been a few years and I've forgotten some things because I did enjoy it. Like I said, I think this is my favorite Grady Hendrix and it was actually thrilling. It made me feel thrilled, which is a good thing if you're reading a thriller, right? I did also just check my notes on this book. So while I remember it very fondly, enjoying it, I did have some issues with the beginning and I also talk about the dialogue feeling stilted and just like a little disjointed, which makes sense and is actually when I think about Grady Hendrix's books, an issue I have kind of frequently. Not that it makes me hate the books or anything like that. It's just kind of like, I don't necessarily think dialogue is Grady Hendrix's like strongest A star, A plus gold star point. But with those things being said, I still really enjoyed this book. The next book I read in October was The Enchanted Hacienda by J.C. Cervantes. This is when things start to feel the same as everything else. There's a couple books I read that were either like based on an hacienda or were witchy and magical small town vibes. And some of them started to feel similar. So it was kind of hard not to compare them to each other. So when I started this one, it had very similar vibes to Payback's a Witch and some of the names were the same. That's another thing I noticed. There is a book I did not finish this month that also similar vibes and like same names as another book that also had similar vibes to this book, which also had similar vibes to Payback's a Witch. So what I'm saying is I read Payback's a Witch. I read The Enchanted Hacienda. I read a book I'll talk about in a second that is called Casa de Brujos. And then I also attempted to read another book that's called Fangs and Frenemies. All of them, these four books, one of them I DNF'd. And I think those were the only four. I'm checking my story graph. Um, I think those were the, the four. Very similar vibes. And then like The Enchanted Hacienda and Payback's a Witch had the same, some same names. And then Casa de Brujos and De Brujas, Casa de Brujas and Fangs and Frenemies, which I ended up DNFing. Same names or like one character was named Brayden and the other one was named Brandon. And I'm like, they are the same name, basically. So very similar. It was hard not to compare. I did enjoy the vibes for most of them, but it was all like, small town witch and she doesn't have magic or someone's threatening her family's magic, right? Very similar vibes. It's what I signed up for. It's what I signed up for, for this time of month. Well, for this time of year, for this month, that is what I wanted. It is what I got <laughs> to varying degrees of success. And it, it's not a complaint, right? I feel like it kind of sounds like I'm complaining. I'm not trying to complain. I'm pointing out a fact. I chose this and some of the books I liked better than others. So in The Enchanted Hacienda, we follow a woman whose name I forgot. Honestly, I'm sorry. I'm so bad at names with the books I read. But I'm remembering more other things. So that has to count for something. So in The Enchanted Hacienda, we follow a woman who gets fired from her publishing job and breaks up with her boyfriend in the same day and then flies back to her family's flower farm in Mexico. And on this flower farm, they sell 
enchanted flowers that are magic. And when she's asked to help with the farm, some issues arise because she doesn't actually have magic. I liked this book. Like I said, very similar vibes to Payback's a Witch. Also, Running Way to an Hacienda. I also just read The Hacienda. And there was another book it reminded me of, but I am not remembering it at the moment. I do wish this book had just focused more on the magic, though. This book is the genre tags are magical realism and romance, which obviously I, I think those are. It is magical realism. But I think it's like mostly romance. It's, you know how there's fantasy that has some romance in it. Not that I really read these books, but I hear people talk about fantasy that has some romance, but that is different than romance that's like in a fantasy setting, right? So this is not a romance or this is not a magical realism that has some romance. This is a romance in a magical realism setting. And I really wanted it to focus on the magic more. That's what I was here for. The romance, I don't know. I just, like, I didn't not care, but I also, like, didn't care as much as I could have. And it's because romance is not one of my genres. Like, I don't really love romance books. I don't really read romance. So with this being mostly romance, I was kind of, I was kind of out, you know? Like, I wanted to read about magic. I picked up this book so I could read about magic. And there was magic, but not as much as I wanted. The next book I read was Mooncakes by Suzanne Walker and Wendy Shu. This is a graphic novel that follows two people. One is like a werewolf or like a shapeshifter and the other is a witch. And they have to team up to try to fight the people who are attacking the werewolf magic. This was very cute. It was a very fast read. This was one I was worried about not getting in October, but I ended up getting it actually like mid month. And then I felt a little bad because I was like, oh, I don't want to read it right now because I'm in the middle of these other books. Um, and I could have just paused, but I was like, no, I don't feel like I have the time to just sit down and read this all in one sitting, which I wanted to do. So I like waited a week or like a week and a half and then I read it. But maybe more people could have gotten through it before the end of the month if I had just read it faster. It's fine. I liked this book. It was very cute. This is one I'm actually thinking about getting a physical copy of. Like this is one that is on my list. If I see it or maybe next year or the year after, get a physical copy of, put it with my graphic novels that I can reread during the cozy fall spooky season. Is very cute. Also, I had forgotten, but it is tagged on Storygraph. I just forgot about it that it is queer. So that was a fun little surprise to start reading it and be like, oh, yes, we love it. We love to see it. The next book I read was The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. This was a reread for me and I talked about in my TBR part of the reason I wanted to reread it was because of this controversy that someone has mentioned to me that I couldn't remember all of the specific details about. And now I think I know what they were talking about. This follows a Groundhog's Day like time loop where every day Evelyn Hardcastle dies and every day until um, Aiden Bishop can find her killer. I'm remembering the names because I'm reading them off the back of the book. He wakes up in the body of a new person and is just trying to find who kills Evelyn Hardcastle. I really enjoyed this book the first time I read it, maybe more than the second time. The first half of this book for me, again, a little slow. And there's parts of it where I was like, man, why did I like this book so much? And especially as I was thinking about the time travel element, because I hate time travel. But that's essentially what a time loop is, right? Where you're reliving the same day over and over again. That's time travel. It's just maybe the only time travel I'm actually kind of okay with. So 
I enjoyed this book. And especially as we got into the latter half and things were happening and I was remembering things or reading things that I'd completely forgotten about that just made my mind go poof. I love this book for so many reasons that I cannot tell you because they are spoilers. So since I can't talk about some of the reasons I love this book, let's just talk about the controversy. I think the controversy around this book is fat phobia. So definitely like a content warning for that if that is something you don't want to read about. However, I don't think it's necessarily a reason to not pick up this book. And this continues the conversation of do we separate the art from the artist? If the bad person in a book, if the antagonist in a book, and this is not even just like necessarily about this book, I'm just talking in general, like I was talking about local woman missing earlier as well. If the bad person, if the antagonist in a book says something evil, uses the R word, says something racist, says something homophobic, says something fat phobic, do we not read the book? Do we say that is the belief of the author since they wrote it into their book and this character said it? So I'm not going to read the book. I think that is a personal decision and I have decided no. I, for me, one of my like signposts for if I'm going to not read a book because I think the author is writing problematic things is what character in the book or characters in the book says that thing. So I DNF'd a book by Brent Weeks. Ooh, I want to say it was called The Blinding Light, but I know it was not called The Blinding Light because that is a song. It was some sort of magic that revolved around colors. And in this book, the antagonist says a lot of sexist things but so does the main character and some of the side characters and even some of the female characters so as I was reading this and the main character I'm pretty sure the main character said this at one point where they were like talking these two characters were talking about a woman and then the main character said well I understand why he beats his wife that's what I remember. It could be a little bit not exactly that, right? Like memory is fallible. But the main character and every character in that book was saying sexist things. So I was like, I'm not going to read this book because this makes me think the author is sexist and it could not be the case. Maybe he just like is creating this world where everyone is sexist. But because of how many people said it and the way it was said and all these different things, I said, I'm out. I'm not reading this. So I think context of who says it matters. And that's why I don't think this book is actually controversial. The characters in this book who are fat phobic are problematic characters. So I don't necessarily think, and I mean, he could be, he could be, but I'm not going to say that Stuart Turton is fat phobic based on the bad characters in his book saying fat phobic things, I think it's fine to say there is fat phobia in this book. Proceed with caution, right? But I don't think we need to avoid the book entirely because I don't think he's actually trying to be like, hey, this is a good way to think. There's so many other bad things that happen in this book. There's so many bad people and with all of the other bad things, I don't think, hey, this, he is behind murdering people, for example, right? There is a murder that is like the center of this book. But just because someone commits murder, I don't think, hey, he must be pro-murder. So I'm also not thinking that with the fat phobia. That's kind of my perspective. There's so much more I want to say, but spoilers. So I'm going to do a quick spoiler section. If you don't want spoilers for this book, jump ahead to the time code that is on the screen.
this is honestly just more detail about the bad people, but it contains spoilers because in the end of the book, like serious, very serious spoilers. If you do not believe me before, seriously, skip. I'm about to spoil the ending of this book if you have not read it. Okay. So in this book, we find out that this is all a prison. This is a futuristic prison. So everyone who is here, who has been sent to prison, is like the worst of the worst people, has committed terrible crimes. And then also all of the like NPCs, if you want to call them that, the people who are not being controlled by prisoners, are also bad people. We have murderers. We have like the guy who is blackmailing everybody and then they're just getting in fist fights willy-nilly like beating puppy people up left and right we have a rapist like and so when these are the people when these are the people who are like selling illegal drugs who are murdering people the rapist like when they're also fat phobic i'm like i would honestly be like low-key surprised if they weren't and I think it just makes sense in the context of everything that's happening. And like I said, I don't think it means that the author necessarily is. Again, it, he could be. We don't have anything to say whether he is or he isn't. But that's why I don't think the controversy around this book is actually that controversial. And I think Alicia just popping in real quick to say I don't talk really in this video about... Um, the jail aspect of it and the punishment aspect of it and how that also is an interesting commentary on jail. I read like the Q&As with the author at the end so it was just very quick but it was like kind of supposed to be also a discussion on prisons and our prison system and like that kind of thing so that is also a very interesting aspect that I've been thinking about even though I didn't really talk about it, but I did want to mention it just real quick. The next book I read was Casa de Brujas by Colleen Cross. I read this book in Spanish. And this book is about, this is the other one that was very similar to some of the other witchy books I read. This is about a woman named Sen and her family, her mom and her aunt, they all own a hotel in this small town that is also like a magical power source. One day they find a man dead in like the driveway of the of their hotel. And it's actually the opening day, the grand opening of their hotel. They find this dead man who is an influential influential travel influencer, I guess is the best word to use. And the aunt becomes a suspect in everything that has happened. I read this book in Spanish, so I told myself I would talk about it in Spanish. So I'm going to say some thoughts about it in Spanish and then probably some more thoughts about it in English. Just honestly, I, I read in Spanish to practice my reading comprehension in Spanish. Just like I listen to podcasts in Spanish to practice listening comprehension. I don't get as much chance to practice actually talking in Spanish. So that's why I'm doing this. I'm happy to receive correction as I have said in other videos, I think, where I say like, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. I just always ask that you're nice. Me guste este libro. Fue un libro interesante. Fue un poquito semejante a los otros libros que leí este mes y como muchos otros libros que leí en el principio del libro, me gustaba, pero no mucho. Tomé un poquito de tiempo para capturar mi atención, pero cuando estaba llegando al final del libro, no quería dejar de leerlo. Okay, like I was saying, it took me a little bit of time to get into this book. The beginning was a little slow. I was enjoying the end. I'm checking my notes. And the end fell into some of the traps of cozy mysteries that I don't particularly love. The next book I read in October was The Taking of Jake Livingston 
This is a YA book about a high school uh, junior. I think he's a junior named Jake who is the only black boy in his grade and he can also see ghosts and sometimes he's honestly not sure what's worse being the only black kid in his grade or actually being able to see ghosts. And there's one ghost that has a plan for him and starts to haunt him. I ended up liking this book. This was about the time though that I was like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can finish all of these books. And I don't know if I should have read this many books. I honestly, I liked this book, but I don't think it got a fair shot because by this time of the month, I was so tired. I was a little bit tired of reading and I was sometimes wishing I was doing other things, but all of the books and especially this that I got from the library and a lot of the other books that I got from the library, I really wanted to finish. And I honestly didn't finish some of the books from my TBR. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I also thought about DNFing this book because this is a YA book, but there was one part where it got a little too gruesome for me. It was towards the beginning. It was like four chapters into the book. And there's a part about spiders and spiders are not like necessarily important to the story, but it was about spiders. And I hate spiders so much that listening to this part of the book made me want to DNF it. So I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't. This is another book that is also queer and I forgot about. So that was fun. I like when that's like a surprise where it's like, surprise, you forgot this book was queer. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot. Here we are. The last book I read in October was Pumpkin Heads by Rainbow Rowell and Faith Erin Hicks. I read this on Halloween. This is a really cute little graphic novel about these two characters who work at a pumpkin patch together every year, but it's Halloween and they're both seniors and they are are not going to work at the pumpkin patch any longer. It's their last night. This is another book I'd read before and enjoyed. So this year I finally bought myself a copy and it was cute and I liked it. And honestly, I don't know what else to say about it besides it's cute. I liked it. I also was low key thinking that maybe next year for Halloween, oops, I'm trying to find a good picture. Um, I should just dress up like these characters because I do think this would be kind of a fun Halloween costume. I feel like I just look like a farmer. But I think it'd be cute to like dress up as like a book character for Halloween. I've actually never done that specifically. I've dressed up as like generic, right? Like not a specific character, but like I could live in the world of uh, of a book. Although now that I'm saying this, this is a lie. I dressed up, but it was not for Halloween. It was for the movie premiere of the first Hunger Games movie. I will not show pictures of this, but I, and I do have pictures, but I dressed up as Effie. Is that her name? Effie, the lady from the Capitol who like was always described as having super weird fashion. So I put on like some super weird outfit. Um, but that's the only time I can remember dressing up as a specific character opposed to being like, I'm going to dress up as someone who could live in this world. So like, for example, if the world was Star Wars, instead of dressing up like Luke Skywalker, what I would often do, not that I actually ever did this. This is just an example because I'm not going to talk about the literary world that I actually did it for. But instead of dressing up as Luke Skywalker, I would just dress up as a Jedi. <laughs> this is a serious tangent, but I have two very good, iconic Halloween costumes that I will put pictures up if I can figure it out. One is when I was two or three years old. My mom handmade this impeccable lion costume. My sister went as the lion tamer. This 
is probably my best Halloween costume ever. If only for the fact that my mom handmade it and it is like chef's kiss beautiful. I want one in adult size. It's amazing. My number two, maybe my, no they are very tied for me in my brain because one is impeccable stitching, impeccable craftsmanship. My mom really went all out 10 out of 10, actually like 100 out of 10 effort on that, on my mom's part. The next costume also my mom helped me make, but I was older and I thought it'd be fun to go as an inanimate object, an idea I actually still love. I love the idea of going as an inanimate object. I went as a brick wall, which is still my humor today. I honestly would revive that costume if I had kept that piece of cardboard, but I might just make a new one because I would still go as a brick wall. Now, that being said, I liked this book. It's a cute graphic novel. It's very fun for Halloween. And there's a fall festival I go to that has kind of similar vibes to this. This is the fall festival. The pumpkin patch in this book is much bigger than the pumpkin patch I go to that is actually like owned by some of my distant family, my mom's cousins, but still like fun vibes. And it's also connected to something that I like to do around this time of year. That was every book I have read in October. Now, what I wanted to do before I finished and I just pulled it up on my computer is go through my list of books that were on my TBR. I have to do this a little bit fast because I only have a couple more minutes of battery, not battery. I have only a couple more minutes of storage. So I don't want to get too deep in the weeds with these books. I'm basically just going to say if I read it or not and give a brief explanation of why I didn't read it or why I DNF'd it. Okay, first, The Night Circus. Read it. The next was A Sudden Light by Garth Stein. I just didn't get around to this. I didn't have enough time. And of all the books I owned physically, I thought this would be the most appropriate to bump. I also bought and started reading another book that will be in next month's TBR that is very much for the fall Halloween season. It's a uh, Silver Nitrate by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. The next book was Seven and a Half Deaths of Evan Hardcastle. I read it. Next was Pumpkinheads. Read it. The Hacienda. Done. Taking of Jake Livingston. Check. The Enchanted Hacienda. A check. A uh, Goblin by Josh Mallerman. This was a big fat DNF. I read, I think the first mini story, what is it called? Novella. And I enjoyed it. And then it kind of switched storylines and I could not do it. It was too graphic and gory for me. And I think this is going to be a solid DNF. I don't think I'm going to try this book again. I have not taken it off of my books I want to read list yet, but I do think I'm going to. I'm just kind of waiting. I'm feeling the vibes within myself to see if I change my mind, but I think I'm going to take it off the list because I don't foresee myself uh, with how gory it was and how graphic coming back to it and being okay with it. Next was Mooncakes, done. Next was Paybacks a Witch, done. Next was Fra Fangs and Frenemies. This was a DNF. I mentioned this earlier. The vibes were very similar to other books, but this one was just felt like it was trying too hard. It was a little silly. I couldn't connect with the writing style. And every time there was like a swear word or a replacement swear word, it somehow was magic related and it felt very cheesy and I just don't think it was for me. So I DNF'd it. And then the next two books were ones I didn't think were going to come in October, but did. And they were Murder and Mammon and Local Woman Missing. So that's it. There was three books in my October TBR I did not get to. Two of them were DNFs though. So I tried. They just didn't work out for me at this time. And like I said with Goblin, I don't know if I'm going to go back or not. Probably not. 
so I should probably just take it off. I'm running out of space, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you read in October down in the comments. Give this video a like if you want to, and I hope to see you in my next one. Bye!